The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi there, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for joining us for today's first session and what a super session we have planned for you. Um, thank you very much for, for coming on and get ready for today's excellent session with Dr. Marshall Goldsmith. Now, before I do anything, can I please ask that you raise your hands just to let me know you can hear me loud and clear. Okay, fantastic. Thank you very much. Really appreciate that. I'm now going to put your hands down. Thank you for letting me know. As always, um, we encourage an interactive session. Um, you are more than welcome to post anything you feel, any comments, questions, feedback, anything at all into the chat box on the right hand side. Um, Marshall will be doing his best to answer as many of those questions as we go. So please, even from the get go, get those questions into the right hand side you have the opportunity to connect with the world's number one leadership thinker as voted by the Harvard Business Review as part of the Thinkers 50. Um, now, what I also encourage you to do is tweet your learning using the hashtag WBECS or WBECS2013. And afterwards, we would love you to jump onto the Facebook wall, facebook.com forward slash WBECS and post your comments, questions, and anything else on there. We've been, you guys have been brilliant this year. I think there's been maybe five times as many comments and questions this, this year as last year. So thank you so much. Um, really appreciate you taking the time to do that. And I know all of the presenters really do appreciate that. So um, I would like to introduce you to Dr. Marshall Goldsmith, who was recently recognized, as I said, earlier as the number one leadership thinker in the world at the biannual Thinkers 50 ceremony. And that was sponsored by the Harvard Business Review. Uh, Marshall is a million selling author um, or editor of 35 books, including the New York Times and Wall Street Journal bestsellers Mojo and What Got You Here Won't Get You There, which probably I'm going to guess about 90 plus percent of you have read. Um, it's a Wall Street Journal number one best-selling business book and winner of the Harold Longman Award for Business Book of the Year. Um, his books have been translated into 28 languages and become bestsellers in 10 countries. He's recently had a book uh, which you should have had a, a link about um, sent through to you, uh, Managers as Mentors, which he co-authored with Chip Bell. Um, now, Marshall's got heaps of professional acknowledgements including institute for management studies lifetime achievement award and that's one of two ever awarded american management association 50 great thinkers and leaders who have influenced the field of management over the past eight years and i'm not going to read this out there's just a list and list and list of awards and accolades now um just to give you a little heads up um me and marshall are having some discussions around a super awesome little retreat so weekend away where you'll get to hang out with Marshall and some of the world's think leading experts um, in our field um, but that's a little tease and I'm not saying anything more um, but just bear that in mind so look forward to that but without further ado I would like to hand over to my good friend Dr. Marshall Goldsmith over to you Marshall thank you so much thank you so much very happy to be here Ben well, uh, for those of you I have not met, I will very briefly introduce myself, and then we're going to get started. I'm going to cover as much material as I can in a short period of time. Um, my name is Marshall. I'm from a small town called Valley Station, Kentucky. I went to undergraduate school in engineering. I, I have a degree in mathematical economics. I went to an engineering school, got an MBA at Indiana University, a PhD at UCLA, I was a college professor and dean when I was very young, and then for 36 years I've done three things. One is giving talks or teaching classes, which is what I love to do the most, and now about half of my speaking is outside of the U.S., so I do travel constantly. The second thing, of course, is coaching executives, which I'm best known for, and my coaching clients are CEOs or could be CEOs of uh, many of the world's leading organizations. I'm coaching the president of the World Bank, I've coached the Alan Mulally, who's now the CEO of Ford, I've worked with the CEO of Walmart and Pfizer and Glaxo and many of the prestigious organizations around the world, the Mayo Clinic, the New York Public Library, and coaching is where I learn everything. What I really love about coaching is not so much what I teach, it's what I learn. I feel like that 
I probably learn about 10 times as much from my clients as they learn from me. And my book, What Got You Here Won't Get You There, is basically all things that I learned from executive coaching. Then the third thing I do is write and edit books and articles. And uh, I said I've done 35 books, and I give everything away. One thing I love about these sessions is so many people from my free session send me emails. I just love getting the emails. Uh, Marshall at MarshallGoldsmith.com. If you send me an email, I can't promise to get back to you immediately, but I'm pretty much always get back to people eventually. So you just have, if you have a little patience with me, I get a lot of emails, but I always try to get back to people. And also, I give all my material away. So if you go to, please go to www.MarshallGoldsmith.com, my website. Uh, all my material, you may copy, share, download, duplicate, use in your coaching, use in charity, use in church, use any of my material any way you wish. I'm a Buddhist. My basic attitude is we will all be equally dead. So we might as well do a little good here. So if any of this stuff does any good for you in any way, please feel free to use it. And um, what are we talking about today? Well, try feed forward instead of feedback. My goal is to share exactly how I coach people. I'll share some of the latest nuances, and our goals are, are pretty straightforward. Now, what are our goals? Uh, let's see. Well, first, I had the privilege before he died of spending 50 days with Peter Drucker. Peter Drucker is the world's greatest authority on management. Peter Drucker said, we spend a lot of time helping leaders learn what to do. We do not spend enough time helping leaders learn what to stop. That one comment led to my book, What Got You Here Won't Get You There. And as kind of an aside, I'm working on a new book now with my good friend Vijay Govindaraja at Dartmouth. And it's an interesting book looking at Hindu philosophy and how it relates to everything from big corporate strategy to micro-level behavior. In Hindu philosophy, there are three basic manifestations of God. Uh, and one of the manifestations is called Vishnu. And Vishnu is basically what do you preserve, what do you keep? Shiva is what do you destroy or what do you get rid of? Then you have Brahma is what do you create? And as we go through life, we have this ongoing balance of what do I want to preserve? What is it about myself I want to keep? What is I need to get rid of? And what is it that I need to create? And the reality is we can't have creation without destruction. We can't just keep piling things on. And it can be hard for us to know what to get rid of. I think one of the reasons my book, What Got You Here, Won't Get You There, is so popular, it's one of the few books that actually talks about the problems that come with success as opposed to the blessings of success. And it talks about, as Peter Drucker said, what to stop. Now, our goals. First, I'm going to talk about some of the classic challenges that come with success in leadership and how to use what to stop in leadership coaching. I'm going to share how Feed Forward works, and again, <clears throat> process that works around the world. Please feel free to try it with all your clients. A proven model you can use to coach others and build teams, and again, uh, all my material is online. Copy, share, download, duplicate, use my coaching process any way you wish. And then I'm going to share the new work I'm doing on employee engagement and active questions with my daughter Kelly, which is very, very exciting. Uh, she's a professor at the Kellogg School of Northwestern. And hopefully this will be something that you can also use with your coaching clients. So by the end of today, you ought to know pretty much what I do. Now, classic challenges of successful leaders. I was interviewed in the Harvard Business Review and asked a question, what is the number one problem of the successful people that you coach? And my answer was very simple, winning too much. What does that mean? If it's important, we want to win. If it's meaningful, we want to win. If it's critical, we want to win. If it's trivial, we want to win. If it's not worth it, we want to win anyway. Winners love winning. Now, this is a very deep concept. When you coach people, the more successful they are, the more they tend to become addicted to winning. In my book, I use a case study of winning too much. You want to go to dinner at restaurant X. Your husband, wife, partner, friend, or significant other wants to go to dinner at restaurant Y. You have a heated argument. You go to restaurant Y. It was not your choice. The food tastes awful and the service is terrible. Option A, critique the food, point out our partner was wrong, and this mistake could have been avoided had you listened to me. Option B, shut up, eat the stupid food, try to enjoy it, and have a nice evening. What would I do? What should I do? Almost all my clients, what would I do? Critique the food. What should I do? Shut up. Well, it's very hard for winners not to constantly win. As bad as that case is, I had another case at Dartmouth that was worse. Uh, about winning too much, and 
and it sounds like this, we have a hard day at work. Your husband, wife, friend, or partner calls, and they said, oh, I have such a hard day. I hate it. It's such a hard day. And if we're not careful, our first reaction is, you had a hard day. You had a hard day. Do you have any idea what I had to put up with today? Do you think you had a hard day? We're so addicted to winning that we have to prove we're more miserable than the people we live with. Well, I gave this example at a class at Dartmouth College, and a young man in the back raised his hand, and he said, I did that last week. I asked him, what happened? He said, my wife looked at me. She said, honey, you just think you had a hard day. It's not over. <laughs> well, I love getting emails. I got an email about five months ago that made my entire week. A gentleman sent me an email, and he said, I was in your class about five years ago. And he said, I know you don't remember me, but I just wanted to send you an email to say thank you. He said, my wife called me up yesterday, and she was having a terrible day and she was talking about her challenges and problems and I was just getting ready to point out how her problems paled in significance to my own. And he said, for some reason, I remembered what you said five years ago. He said, I just shut up, listened to my wife and said, I love you. Thank you for all the sacrifices you've made for our family. He said, I spent 25 bucks bought some flowers, went home, gave her the flowers, and said, I love you. Thank you so much for all you've done. He said it was the best $25 he'd ever spent in his life. Well, I think very important when you coach your clients, really have people think about, what am I winning here? What am I winning? How important is it for me to be right? And it's very hard for winners not to win. Number two, classic problem, adding too much value. What does this mean? I'm young, smart, enthusiastic. You're my boss. I come to you with an idea. You think it's a great idea. Rather than just saying great idea, our natural tendency is to say, well, that's a nice idea. Why don't you add this to it? The problem is the quality of the idea may go up 5%. My commitment to execute may go down 50%. It's no longer my idea. Now it's yours. Very hard for smart, successful people not to constantly go through life adding value. One of my good coaching clients retired about six years ago. His name is J.P. Garnier. JP was the CEO of a very large drug company, GlaxoSmithKline. I asked JP, what did you learn about leadership as, as being the CEO of this company? He said, I learned a very hard lesson. My suggestions become orders. My suggestions become orders. He said, if they're smart, they're orders. If they're stupid, they're orders. If I want them to be orders, they're orders. And if I don't want them to be orders, they're orders anyway. My suggestions become orders. I asked him, what did you learn from me when I was your executive coach that helped you the most. He said, the one thing you taught me that helped me the most is to stop and breathe before I talk. Stop and breathe and think, is it worth it before I speak? And he said, as the CEO of this huge company, 50% of the time, if I had the discipline to stop and breathe and ask myself, is it worth it? What did I decide? Am I right? Maybe. Is it worth it? No. Now, every year I teach the new animal school for the United States Navy. What's the first thing I teach those new animals when they get those little stars? When you get that little star, your suggestions become orders. Animals don't make suggestions. When an animal makes a suggestion, what's the response? Sir, yes, sir. That suggestion becomes an order. Well, I think very important when you work with your coaching clients, and the higher up they are, the more this is true, to get them to stop and breathe and realize the impact of their words and their nonverbal communication. One of the people I'm coaching right now is a fantastic leader. He's a great guy. And one of his problems is when people would speak, he would roll his eyes and make sarcastic comments. Well, you know, he's a wonderful man. He had no intention of ever doing anything bad or hurting people. But he had to learn you can't do that if you're the CEO of a multi-billion dollar company. What happens is everyone in that room is looking at his face. I'm some kid. I spent six months making a presentation. This is my big chance to look good in front of the CEO. He rolls his eyes and makes a sarcastic comment. I am completely demoralized, and my career is probably over. Well, the CEO, he had no bad intention, but that's what happens. One of my good coaching clients retired. Oh, excuse me. One of my good coaching clients is Liz Smith. Liz was the president of Avon. She left Avon, uh, and now she's the CEO of a company called Bloomin' Brands. They own Outback, Fleming's, Roy's, a bunch of restaurants, and doing 
spectacularly well. She's a wonderful, wonderful leader and a great person. When I was her coach at Avon, her boss was Andrea Young, the CEO. So Liz looks at Andrea when we're talking about this coaching and says, Andrea, does this coaching mean I have to watch what I say and how I act in every meeting for the rest of my career? Andrea says, welcome to my world. That's exactly what it means. Well, that is what it means. I was just coaching a brand new CEO. And one of the things I told him is, the old saying, it's lonely at the top, is very true. It is very lonely. You're on stage all the time. And by the way, a lot of your job is excruciatingly boring. You're sitting there listening to PowerPoint slides that you already know everything's being said, and you have to look like you care. You can't always care. You have to look like you care. Why? And don't look at that as being a phony. Look at that as being a professional. Everyone in that room is looking at your face, and if you appear disinterested or bored or checked out, they are all demoralized. You can't do that. Well, easy to understand in theory. It's tough in practice. By the way, I coach a lot of CEOs. I'm not a CEO. I don't think I would be a good CEO, and I'm not sure I'd even want to be a CEO. Being a good CEO is a hard job. It is a hard job. It is You're on all the time. You're being constantly scrutinized by the press. Every email you send could be subject to a lawsuit. So it's tough, and it's not getting easier. It's getting harder with Sarbanes-Oxley and other challenges. Next classic challenge of successful people, especially smart people. I already knew that. It is incredibly difficult for a smart person to listen to somebody tell us what we already know without us pointing out we already know it. When you coach people, try to catch them. When you coach them, teach them not to do that to you. Because if you're not careful, they'll just point out that they already knew everything you said. Because it is so hard not to do this. I try to teach my clients, if I tell you something you already know, just say thank you. Get in the habit of just saying thank you. If I'm young and enthusiastic and I come to you with a great idea, and you did already know it, just say great idea. You don't have to prove you're smarter than me. Just say great idea. And then the next one, passing too much judgment. Now, one thing I love about what we all do is it doesn't just help people at work. It helps people in their lives. I try to give people four words that help them not only become a better coach, but a better family member and have a happier life. What are these four simple words? Help more and judge less. It is very hard for us not to constantly go through life judging people. And to the degree you get your clients to focus a little bit more on helping and a little bit less on judging, everything works better. And that's a key tenet of Feed Forward, which we're going to talk about. Now, Ben, are we ready to get some audience responses? We, I am ready and ready to rock and roll. If, if uh, what would you like? Do you want to? I'm going to ask the group a. I'm going to ask the group a question. Okay. Okay. Now, there's not a right answer to this question, but I want people to send you a number between one and a hundred. What percent of all interpersonal communication time is spent on a people talking about how smart, special, and wonderful they are, or listening to someone do this, plus b people talking about how stupid and if they're bad somebody else is, or listening to people do this? There is not a correct answer. There's not a God up in the sky counting people's comments. Obviously, we're all just guessing. I have asked over 100,000 people from around the world this question. I'd love to get the audience reaction, and then after a few people send in their numbers, I'll tell you how your scores compare with the average scores in the world. So to your marks, get set, go. Send in a number between 0 and 100. Take A plus B divided by all communication time. The number can't be 0 or 100. A number between 0 and 100 and send it to Ben. Okay. And Ben, as you start getting numbers, you can you just read the numbers to me. Okay, here they come. We got 20, 70, 77%, and 90, yeah. 80, 60, 60, 90, 90, 80, 90, 100, 75, 50, 80, 90, 85. That, that, that's enough. Gives us a sparkling, a sprinkling anyway. The average score in the whole world on this exercise is right about 65%. Now, there's not a right score, so this isn't a contest of rightness or wrongness. We're all just guessing. The average score is 65%. And here's what's interesting. It doesn't matter what country I'm in. I have never seen the score go below 50 in any country, and it's almost always between 55 and 75 if you have a large group of people. 
So the average score in the world, right about 65%. Now, nobody knows what that number is. It's a big number. Now, I'm going. this next question is a yes-no one. And, and if you don't mind, uh, the listeners, if you could just send Ben some yeses or noes on this one. I ask my clients a question. Oh, or no, in fact, I'm going to make it a numerical question. This will be more interesting, a, a number question. I ask my clients a question when I teach classes. I say, how many of you feel about as busy today and under as much pressure today as you have felt in your whole lives? And then I say, raise your hands. And again, all you executive coaches out there, that's not a right or wrong answer. We're all just guessing. What percent of the people that we work with, the executives we work with, feel about as busy today and under as much pressure today as they felt in their whole lives, given emails, texts, voicemails, global competition, and the changing world of business? Just send Ben a number between, again, 0 and 100. What do you think? And Ben, if you can just read me the numbers. Okay. Uh, 90, 100, 95, 5, 85, 95, 90, 65, 50, 90, 100. Yeah. And again, I, I find this number very high. And again, this is not an exact science. The other one, the 65% was pretty precise. This is more of a guess. But I'm guessing of the people that I work with, it's about an 80. It's a big number. So people feel under incredible pressure right now. So one thing I do as I do this exercise, so I ask people to fill out this first question, what percent of all interpersonal communication time averages about 65? Then I say, how many of you feel about as busy today as you've ever felt in your life? And, you know, 80% raise their hands. Then I say, now I'm going to give you a productivity enhancement tool for yourself and for your teams. What is that productivity enhancement tool? Uh, reduce this number. <laughs> How much do we learn talking about how smart, special, wonderful we are? Nothing. How much do we learn talking about how dumb other people are? Nothing. How much do we learn listening to that? Nothing. What percent of all communication time is wasted on that? 65. Reduce the number. Now, here's a way to reduce the number. It's called using small amounts of money to create large changes in behavior. Small amounts of money to create large changes in behavior. Totally counterintuitive and shockingly effective. Over the years, the big CEOs I've coached, mostly women or men, men, mostly young or old, old, poor, or rich, rich, mostly a bunch of rich old men. Now, I do a lot of volunteer work, but other than the volunteer work I do, it's mostly I'm coaching rich old men. They're the ones that pay me enough money so I can do volunteer work and help people that aren't rich old men. Now, obviously, I've worked with some great women leaders, but they're mostly men, mostly men, 70, 75% men. A common misperception about rich old men is some people believe rich old men wouldn't mind losing tiny amounts of money. That would be wrong. Rich old men hate losing any money. Watch them play golf. They play golf for $5. They lie. They cheat. They swear at each other. They can't stand losing. Now, it is shocking how well this works as a coaching tool, using small amounts of money to create large changes of behavior. I've been told you can't change the behavior of an investment banker if you do not change their compensation plan. That would be wrong. I've helped many investment bankers change their behavior, and I never change the compensation plan. I use tiny amounts of money, and it works just as well. The first one is called destructive comments. Destructive comments, those nasty comments about our coworkers. Now, almost every company preaches this sermon. We want to create an environment where people reach out across the organization. We want to build positive, synergistic, win-win relationships with our colleagues. We don't like those silos. Let's tear down those bad silos. Well, very easy to preach, but what happens to all this corporate happy talk when we stab our coworkers in the back? Does it make it better or worse? Much worse, a bad habit. Now, I don't want to sound like I'm preaching right now because I also get feedback. And by the way, as an executive coach, I think it's very good for you to get feedback as well. I get feedback all the time. Um, the first time I got evaluated by people I worked with, one item was called avoids destructive comments about other people. What score did I make? Eight percentile. Eight. Ninety-two percent of the people in the world did better than me, and I wrote the test. I go back to my staff and said, staff, overall, I'm proud of most of my feedback. I feel good about this and this. There's something I want to do better. This business is not bum-wrapping people. I teach everyone else not to do that. I've been one of the worst offenders. I said, if you ever hear me do this again, bring it to my attention. I'm going to pay you 10 bucks on the spot because I'm going to break this terrible habit. 
Well, then I gave him a pep talk because I thought it was embarrassing. They'd be embarrassed to ask for the money. Pep talk wasn't needed. They tricked me into making nasty comments so they could pick up 10 bucks. Well, I no more gave this pep talk to one of our clients called. He said, we need this and this. I said, he wants something he doesn't want to pay. is cheap. $10. My friend Tim calls. I said, that fool had to get a PhD. He knows nothing. $10. By noon, I've lost 50 bucks and refused to speak to anyone for the rest of the day. The first day, it cost me 50 bucks. The second day, 30 bucks. And the third day, 10 bucks. Does it still cost me money? Yep. What score did I make last time? 4.8 out of 5. What does that prove? You spend a few thousand bucks, you get a little bit better. Well, with my clients, it's amazing how well this works because they don't realize how many destructive comments they make and how many destructive comments people and their teams make about each other when they're supposed to be promoting teamwork. Um, let me give an example from a, a, one of my classes. A woman in my class said, my teenagers are so negative. I'm going to implement this when I go home with my children. I'm going to implement this when I go home with my children. One dollar every time they make a destructive comment and ten dollars for mommy and daddy. She sent me an email six months later. The email said, I'm amazed at how much more positive my teenagers have become. I'm ashamed at how much money I have lost. She said it became painfully obvious to me where were my children picking this up? Me. And she said I was gifted at seeing this problem in my children. I just couldn't see it in myself. Well, very good to teach people the impact that this kind of stuff has. We often don't even hear ourselves saying it. Now, again, everything I've learned, pretty much I learned from wonderful leaders. One of the wonderful leaders I worked with is a man named General Eric Shinseki. General Eric Shinseki is a great man. Uh, it was a U.S. soldier in the U.S. Army. He got shot, didn't have to go back into combat, did. He pretty much got his foot blown off. He Stayed with the Army, became a four-star general. He's the man that stood up to Donald Rumsfeld and said the Iraq War would take a lot of troops and cost money and was publicly crucified for telling the truth. And now he's the Secretary of Veterans Affairs, a wonderful man who reports to President Obama. When he was head of the uh, U.S. Army, we were having dinner one night with a bunch of two- to four-star generals. So he looks at me and says, Marshall, who's your favorite customer? I said, sir. My favorite customer, smart, dedicated, hardworking, driven to achieve, creative, entrepreneurial, cares about the company, cares about the customers, great values, high integrity, gets results, and is a stubborn, opinionated, know-it-all that never wants to be wrong. I said, sir, do you think any of the generals in this very room may fit such a description? He looks at me and he smiles and he says, Marshall, we have a target-rich opportunity. <laughs> well... How many of you listening to me, even you executive coaches, are a little stubborn or opinionated? And what percent of those executives you coach are stubborn and opinionated? Well, that's a big number. One thing that's great when you work with stubborn people is try to teach them not to start sentences with three words, no, but, or however. If you talk to me and the first word out of my mouth is no, what did I just say? Shut up, you're wrong. What does but mean? Disregard everything that's came before this word. However, that's a fancy word for but. Well, one of my clients is stubborn and opinionated, and I find my coaching clients $20 every time they commit a sin. These people are so rich, if they drop $20 on the ground, it's not worth bidding over to pick up, but they'd rather die than lose $20. So he, I'm giving him feedback, and he says, but Marshall, I said, that's free. If I ever talk to you again and you start a sentence with no butter or however, I'm going to find you $20. He said, but Marshall, 20 no, 40 no, 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 60 800 He lost $420 in an hour and a half. At the end of an hour and a half, what did he say? He said, thank you. I did that 21 times with you bringing it to my attention. How many times would I have done it had you not been bringing it to my attention? 50 times, 100 times. No wonder people think I'm stubborn. Oh, by the way, when I work with my clients, I teach classes, I do these finding money things, and all the money goes to nice charities. How much money have I raised for a nice charities playing these little games with my clients over the years? Over eight hundred thousand dollars and the nice thing is it doesn't hurt anybody very much now next what is one of the worst things any of us can do when we recognize another human being that is great but that is great but what impact does that word but have on recognition disregard everything I just said we're bad at worse work and we're worse at home case study Kid home, comes home from school with a report card. Daddy, Mommy, look at my report card from school. 
five times I made the highest grade, and one time I made almost the high grade. If we're not careful, what do we now say, Daddy and Mommy? That is great, but why didn't you make the high grade every time? What's the kid thinking? That is great, but why do I have an ass like you for a parent? Well, I got an email several years ago from a gentleman in my class, and he said, I just lived the That's Great But case study with my son. In the United States, the highest grade is called an A, and the second high grade would be a B. He said, my son came home from school with five A's and a B. And I remembered your little talk. I said, son, that's great. I'm proud of you. Then he continued the email and said, my son sat there in silence. He continued on. He said, I said again, son, that's great. Daddy is proud. Then he wrote, my son looked at me and asked, when are you going to start yelling at me? He said, I'm not going to yell at you. I'm proud of you. Well, if we say that's great, but enough times to the people we love, you know, we teach them. There is no great. Now, I had an even deeper story a couple of months ago. I was just in India teaching a class. And a gentleman in the class went to my class and came home and told his family the story of the other father. He was kind of laughing about the other father. His son looked at him and he said, Daddy, you think that's bad? I made five A pluses and one A. And you told me that's great, but... He said, I'll never forget that. I was so hurt. Well, the father was just mortified. He felt so bad. He said, my kid was the number one student in his entire school. And the only message he was getting from me was, you're not good enough. So very important. And by the way, one thing I love about what we do as executive coaches is for everybody we coach, not everybody, but almost everybody we coach, what we do wrong at work, we do wrong at home. We do wrong with our friends, with our family, with everyone around us. So this stuff not only helps people be better leaders, it helps people have better lives. Now, moving on. Um, next, plain favorites. Uh, every company I work with has a leadership profile. Every company has a leadership profile. And it all talks about what they want from their leaders. And basically, I've seen hundreds of these. They say the same thing, customer quality, integrity, value, people. It's all great stuff. There's one item that's not on any of those profiles. What's it called? Effectively sucks up to higher management. Every company says we hate suck-ups. Every leader hates suck-ups. I have one question. If everyone hates suck-ups so much, why does so much sucking up go on? Well, it goes on because we all tend to create an environment where people learn to suck up to us. Now, most people, like I'm teaching this, are going, Yes, Marshall is a good point. I see other leaders encourage suck-ups all the time. Um, not me, of course, but other bad leaders. I'm going to prove to even some of the executive coaches listening to me right now how you encourage suck-ups. You're probably thinking, I would never do such a bad thing. I coach executives. I teach them not to do that. I wouldn't encourage suck-ups. Okay, Ben, are you ready? I'm ready to rock and roll. Okay, here we come. I want... Everyone listening that has a dog that you love, send Ben the name of your favorite dog. <laughs> that dog that you love, send Ben the dog's name. You should be getting some dog's names. Are you serious? <laughs> of course. <laughs> Do you want, want to start reading them out? Yeah, read these names. I love dog names. <laughs> okay, we've got Todd, Sassy, Lisa, Gizmo. Uh, Gizmo, Ma I love that one. <laughs> <laughs> Maple. Gus, Jack, Char Chachi, uh, Chachi, yeah, that's probably, Bell, Bell, that's the name of our dog, hey, uh, Sebastian, Very good. Fussy, Fussy, uh, Anton, Piper, Romeo, Kona, Romeo, a romantic dog, <laughs> Pamuk, <laughs> I love this, okay, now all of you dog lovers, okay, all of you dog lovers, now you're going to send Ben an answer to the following question. You have to have a dog that you love to answer this question. What member of your family gets the most unqualified positive recognition? Would that be your husband or wife or partner? Would it be your kids or would it be your dog? Who gets the most unqualified positive recognition at home? Okay, dog lovers, send me your answer. We have dog, 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 cat. <laughs> Dog, 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 dog. My son. The dog, dog, the dog, 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 dog. is winning. The dog is winning in a landslide. 
<laughs> the dog is victorious. Now, you don't, have, you don't have to answer this question, but one question I ask people I work with is, do you really love your dog more than the other members of your family? And of course, they'll say, oh, no, no, I don't love the dog the most. Well, then I say, wait a minute. Then why is the family member that gets the most positive recognition your dog? <laughs> okay, Ben, have everybody send you some comments. Here's the question. In almost every family that owns a dog, the family member that gets the most unqualified positive recognition is the dog. Okay, I want, your, I want all the listeners to send in an answer. Why is the winner the dog? And then, Ben, you read the responses to me. Okay, we'll have to give it all. Okay, because he can't talk back. <laughs> the dog can't talk back. <laughs> Suck up. Uh, unconditional he sucks love. Up. <laughs> Uh, it doesn't talk, doesn't talk back, doesn't talk back. He responds. Uh, the, he responds. The dog doesn't judge. Um, the dog gives unconditional love, unconditional love. Unconditional back. love. Okay, you can stop now. Now, this is great. When you come home, is the dog happy to see you? Yes. If you come home late, is the dog still happy to see you? Yes. If you come home late and drunk, is the dog still happy to see you? Yes. The dog is a suck up. And what behavior do we all reinforce? We all unconsciously reinforce the suck-ups. Now, my funniest story about this, I'm teaching at Dartmouth. A woman in my class, she says, my husband loves the dog more than me. She actually confronted her husband about this. She said, I believe you love the dog more than me. Her husband, hoping for occasional sex, said, oh, no, no, I love you more than a dog. She goes, liar, liar. I think he loves the dog more than me. She decides to go home and act like a dog. She said, I'm going to go home and act like a dog and see how my husband treats me when I act like a dog. So she goes home, locks the dog in the backyard. She does her hands like little paws. She starts hopping up and down. She hops over to her husband and goes, woof, 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 and starts licking her husband. What did her husband say? This is great. <laughs> well, without meaning to, we all tend to reinforce people who reinforce us. Now, here's some great guidelines your coaches can use with your clients. Have them rank order, have all the coaches, all the people you work with rank order their direct reports four ways. Number one, how much do they like me? Now, your executive may say, well, I don't know how much they like you. It doesn't matter. How much do you think they like you? If you have 10, rank order from one to 10. Number two, how much are they like me? How much do they remind me of that ever so special me? See, a lot of people that I coach play favorites with people they don't like. It sounds like this. Yeah, that Joe's a jerk, but he's an engineer. Yes, Mary's a fine person, but not an engineer. What's the message if you're not an engineer or you're not a salesperson or if you're not like me, you don't count? Number three, what is their contribution to the organization and our customers? And then number four, how much positive personal recognition do I give them? Well, if we're honest with ourselves, in about 15 to 20 percent of the cases, the people I coach find that recognition is more highly correlated with one or two than it is with three, and they might be falling into a trap that and we don't like in others, teaching others to suck up, teaching people to suck up to us. Now, next, learning from a great leader. Uh, as I said, I, I have wonderful people I coach, and I've learned so much from them. In my coaching, I have a very different approach, and I'm not saying it's right or wrong, it's just different. I have a very narrow area of coaching expertise. My whole area is just helping successful leaders achieve positive long-term change in behavior. Let me repeat this. I help successful leaders achieve positive long-term change in behavior for themselves, for their people, and for their teams. That's all I do. I don't do strategy. I don't do getting organized. David Allen does getting organized. Vijay Govindarajan does strategy. I don't do that stuff. All I do is this one narrow part of coaching. And I don't say that's better than other types of coaching. It's just what I do. Now, in my coaching, I don't get paid if my clients don't get better. Better is not judged by me or them. It's judged by everyone around them. This is a great way to test if someone really believes what they're teaching. You can ask them one question. Do you want to bet on it? They say, I believe it, but I wouldn't bet on it. They might not believe it so much. They say, here's the money. They believe it. I bet on this every time. The client I coached, that I spent the most amount of time with did not improve at all. I didn't get paid one cent for a year and a half of work. The client I coached, I spent the least amount of time with improved more than anyone I ever coached. 200 people got better and I did get paid. Now this was a humbling lesson for me. As a mathematician, I made a chart. 
on one dimension it was called time spent with Marshall Goldsmith. The other dimension was called improvement. There seemed to be a clear negative correlation between spending time with me and getting better. I thought, well, that's kind of a humbling chart. So I go talk to my client who improved the most, who was fantastic to start with, who I learned 10 times as much from him as he ever learned from me, and was the CEO of the year in the United States last year. His name is Alan Mulally. Alan, CEO of Ford Motor Company, a spectacular leader, a wonderful human being, fantastic job of leading the Ford Motor Company from oblivion to success. So I go talk to Alan. I said, Alan, of all the people I coached, you, I spent the least amount of time with you. You improved the most, and you were great to start with. And I said, number two, I showed him my chart. The way this chart looks, had you never met me, you'd be really good. Now I ask Alan, what should I learn about coaching from you? Alan Mulally, CEO Ford, taught me two lessons about executive coaching I'm going to share with you. And take these in any way that you want to take it. He said, lesson one, Marshall, your biggest challenge as an executive coach is called customer selection. If you pick the right customer, your coaching process will always work. And if you pick the wrong customer, it will never work. And he said, too, never make the coaching process about yourself, your own ego, and how smart you are. Make it about the great people you coach, how proud you are of them, and how hard they work. Oh, these were such great lessons. Totally changed my career. He basically also said, make your career help winners, not fix losers. Whoa. Very deep advice and very good advice. Totally changed my career, by the way, in a positive way. Well, most of us don't deeply understand these points. Hmm. Okay, Ben, are you ready to get some more responses? I am indeed, Marshall. Ben, can you hear me? I am, yes. Can you hear me? Hello, hello. Yeah, I can hear you now. Ben, are you ready for some responses? I'm ready to rock and roll. Okay, for all the people out there that have a husband, wife, or partner and are trying to change the behavior of a husband, wife, or partner who has no interest in changing, here's the question. How many years have you been attempting to change the behavior of your husband, wife, or partner who has absolutely no interest in changing? Please send Ben the number of years you've been doing this. And Ben, you can read the numbers to me. Okay, we have 5, 20, 16, too many, 25, 13, 3, 30, 24, 2, 0. We've got a, we've got a couple of 30s out there. <laughs> 30, another 30. 34, this is 34, we have a new record. Let's see if anyone's going to beat 34. Uh... 35, 37. 37. Oh, my goodness. Well, congratulations on being married 37 years. I've been married 38 years. So cause somebody's, you, you have to be with the same person 37 years. That's a lot anyway. <laughs> now, I'm going to – all you coaches out there, this is a great lesson for you coaches. In terms of trying to change the behavior of adults, it's very hard for coaches to hear this lesson. If they do not care, do not waste your time. How much of our lives have been wasted trying to change the behavior of adults that don't care, and what's our return on that investment? And I always teach my clients, look, when you're coaching others, if they don't care, don't waste your time. They're not going to get better anyway. Then the second learning point that I always teach my clients is if you do not care, do not waste your time. I always tell my coaching clients, if you're going to get better, the motivation for your improvement is going to come from one and only one place. That's in your heart. If it doesn't come from in your heart, you're not going to do it anyway. Now, I'm not recommending this to other coaches, but I'm sharing what I do myself. I don't convince anybody to do anything. If some executive comes to me and says, prove to me this coaching process is worthwhile, you know what my reaction is? For you, it's probably not. Why? They've got to want to do it. I can't make them want to do it. Look at these people I coach. These are very distinguished people. What am I supposed to do? I can't make them change what they don't want to change. What am I going to do? Shoot them, beat them up, kill them? I can help them change what they do want to change. As a coach, and maybe you can make people change what they don't want to. If you, are, if you can, you're a better person than I am. You can definitely help people change what they do want to. And to me, that's good enough. So if we look at this learning, really focus on coaching people that want to get better and care. 
And then when I teach feed forward, now we're going to get into feed forward, I teach classes, I say pick one behavioral change that's going to make a positive difference for you, for everyone in the class. And then why will this change make a difference? And I say whatever you pick has to come from your own heart. And then I have them share that with a person. They, they break up into twos and they share it with their partner. Oh, by the way, if you'd like a copy, if you haven't gotten a copy already of my Feed Forward article or any of my coaching articles, send me an email. I'll send you copies of all that stuff. So again, I give it away anyway. Or you can go to my website. It's all on my website either if you'd rather do that. Now, then how does the Feed Forward exercise work? And then I'll talk about how I use it in coaching. In the Feed Forward exercise, I say we're now going to practice Feed Forward. And by the way, on my website, there's also some videos on this too, I think. We're now going to practice Feed Forward. In Feed Forward, you're going to be in two roles. Role number one is called learn as much as I can. And then I would say, are there smart people in this room? Yes or no? And everybody says yes. I said, well, if you had a chance to learn from these smart people, would you like to do that? And I'll say yes. And I said, well, good. This is going to be your challenge. Learn from these smart people. And then role two is called help as much as I can. I say, are there nice people in this room? Yes or no? And they always say yes. I say, well, if you had a chance to help these nice people, would you like to help them? So you're either learning which is good or helping which is good. Now, what are the rules of Feed Forward? Rule number one is no feedback about the past. In Feed Forward, we don't talk about the past. We spend too much time in life talking about the past anyway. All my listeners, how many of you have been impressed with your wife, husband, or partner's near photographic memory of your previous sins, which have been documented and will be shared with you in a repetitive and annoying way? Well, you know what? We can't change the past anyway. So first thing it says, let go of the past. Second, you can't judge or critique ideas. Now, I'm a Buddhist. Feed Forward is a very Buddhist concept. I'm not a religious Buddhist, I'm a philosophical Buddhist. You can be any religion and be a Buddhist like I am. Feed forward is a very Buddhist concept. Buddha said, only do what I teach if it works for you. If it doesn't work for you, don't do it. Well, in feed forward, we ask for ideas. And we treat the ideas like a gift. And if people give us a gift, should we say, stinky gift, bad gift, I don't like your stupid gift. What should you say to the nice people who give you a gift? Thank you. If you want to use the gift, use it. Don't use a gift, put it in the closet. You already have the gift, repackage it, and give it to your mother-in-law. Just say thank you. Well, then what I do is I say, now you're going to talk to as many people as you can possibly talk to in the next five or ten minutes. And everyone says, my name is Jim. I want to get better at listening. The person they talk to, my name is Mary. I want to get better at recognition. They give each other one or two very quick ideas for the future, no feedback about the past, and they run around and talk to as many people as they can. At the end of the exercise, I ask people, say, give me one word to describe this exercise. They invariably say positive, useful, helpful, or even fun. Then I say, what's the last word you think to describe any feedback activity? Fun. Has anyone ever called you on the phone and said, I have feedback I'd like to share with you. Please come into my office. And you said, fun, fun, fun. Fun is the last word you think of. And I've done this all around the world. No matter what country I'm in, 95% of people say it's positive, useful, helpful, or even fun. They say, okay, break up into small groups. Give me a list of reasons. Why is it fun? Well, they say, well, it's focused on a future I can change, not a past I can change. It's fast. It's positive. There's no judging. I get to learn a lot in a short period of time. I don't have to do this stuff. I've got nothing to lose and a lot to gain. Then I say, fine. Well, let's talk about how you can use this in your coaching. And feed forward is kind of the, the essence of how I coach people. So after they do the feed forward exercise, they say, all right, sit next to your partner again. You go through, what is the behavior I wanted to change? What did I learn when I did feed forward? And what am I going to do about it? Then you ask for ideas to help ensure back on the job execution. So you say to your partner, give me ideas to make sure that when I leave the room, I really do it. And they say, thank you. Again, no judging or critiquing. See, the problem with everything I teach is not theory. Everything I teach works. The problem is execution. It doesn't work if you don't do it. When my book, What Got You Here and Won't Get You There, was the number one best-selling business book in the whole United States, the number one best-selling diet book in the whole United States sold 10 times as many copies. Americans get fatter and fatter and fatter and buy more and more diet books. No one loses weight because you buy a diet book. You actually got to go on a diet. I made one mistake with my book. Terrible mistake. Too late now. The title. I love the title. What Got You Here Won't Get You There. I had to write it over. I would have changed the title. I should have named it, what got you here won't get you there, diet. Then I would have really sold a lot of copies. <laughs> well, the problem isn't knowing what to do. The problem is doing it. Uh, we have so many books on leadership and all these concepts. 
the people I work with, their problem is not understanding the practice of leadership. Their challenge is practicing their understanding of leadership. My friend Jim Kuzis and Barry Posner wrote a book called The Leadership Challenge 25 years ago. Fantastic book. And by the way, everything they said 25 years ago is still true. If you did all that stuff, you'd be a fantastic leader. This isn't new news. There's a lot of good research that shows what you need to do to be a good leader. The problem isn't understanding it. The problem is doing it. Now, here's my model for coaching and leadership development. Number one, ask. Get in the habit of asking for input, listening to it, thinking about it, not responding, thanking in a non-judgmental way. Then respond. And when you respond, do it in a positive, simple, focused way. Involve that other person. Change and follow up. Now let's talk about each one of these steps in the coaching process or the development process. Step one is asking. One of the things is I try to teach my people I coach to learn from everyone around them. Nine, see, my coaching process is very transferable. Why is it transferable? 95% of what the people I coach learn, they don't learn from me anyway. I'm a facilitator who helps them learn from everyone around them. Now, my friend Jim Kuzis did a leadership profile study. 70,000 people evaluated their bosses. One item came in dead last when people evaluated their bosses. Ask people what he or she can do to improve. We don't ask at work, and at home we ask even less. We don't ask our children, our parents, our partners, our friends. Well, get in the habit of asking. And we don't ask for input typically because we're afraid of the answer. So the leaders I coach, they need to have the courage to ask. Then after we ask, listen. And the first thing we want to do when we ask for input is the last thing we should do. What's that? Ask for input, then express my opinion. If I ask you for input and immediately start expressing my opinion, what's that sound like? Defensiveness, denial, rationalization. Don't make excuses. Just teach people to listen. Think. Now, who's the greatest leader I ever met in my life? The greatest leader I've ever met in my life is a woman named Frances Hesselman. Peter Drucker said Frances was the greatest leader he ever met. She was leader of the Girl Scouts of the United States for 14 years. Uh, Alan Mulally, CEO for General Shinseki, all agreed. Frances the greatest leader they ever met. She's a winner of the Presidential Medal of Freedom for being a great leader. She's a wonderful woman. She's edited many books with me, and one of her books was Business Week Book of the Year last year. She does one thing before she talks that almost none of us do. What is it? Think. What do most of us do when we get angry? What do most of us do when we get feedback? We talk. She has the discipline to stop and think and not speak when angry or out of control. A good quote from Francis Hesselmeyer. Why should I be entrusted to control anything else if I can't even control myself? Think. Then thank people. And when you thank people, avoid punishing the, mus the messenger. Now, I do this little exercise. I ask people in my classes, hey, should companies encourage honest input? Everybody goes, oh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, then um, uh, should you listen to this input? Yes, 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 yes. And I said, would punishing the messenger, punishing the people who are trying to tell us the truth, would that be a bad thing? Oh, terrible thing, awful. Would you do that? Oh, never, never, never. Then I do a case study. Okay, Ben, get ready. We're going to have a case study. This is a case study about punishing the messenger. And I point out how we all tend to punish the messenger much more than we think. You have a hard day at work. Okay, everybody get ready to respond to this question. You have a hard day at work. Your husband, wife, friend, or partner is there. You go home, you get in the car to go to the store. You're driving to the store. Lots of traffic. Cars are cutting in front of you. That person in the front seat goes, Look out! There's a red light up ahead! Did you say thank you? Or did you say something that sounded a little more like, What do you mean there's a red light ahead? Don't you think I could see? I'm going to drive the car. Why don't you be quiet? Let me drive. Well, Ben, for everyone, why do we yell at that person in the front seat? Instead of just saying thank you, why are we yelling at that person in the front seat? Okay, Ben, question to all your listeners. Send in Ben the answer. Why do we yell at that person in the front seat instead of just saying thank you? Ben, read me the responses. Okay, uh, next, natural reaction to being yelled at. Um, stop, stop, stop. First, they yelled at me, therefore I yelled at them. Okay, what's the second one? Undermines my ability. Uh, they undermined my ability. Read me the third one. 
Uh, they have scared me. Oh, I was frightened. Oh, the terrible person in the front seat frightened me, and I yelled because I was so frightened. Read me another one. Um, we've got quite a few that are ego or pride. Well, the first three you mentioned were all blaming the other person. The deeper reason we yell at that person is too much ego and too much pride. Too much ego and too much pride. And do we pay a price later for that prideful and ego egotistical outburst? Yes. Uh, oh, send, give me some comments on this. What is the price you pay for that prideful and egotistical outburst? I'd love to hear some of these. <laughs> send Ben your answers. What is the price you paid for that prideful and egotistical outburst? <laughs> Silence. Um, no sex. Um, lousy evening. <laughs> Stress. <laughs> Silence, no sex. Uh, shame. What else? No love. Um, no love. Feeling guilty. Uh, no sex. There's quite a lot of no sex. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> was that a smart outburst or a stupid outburst? Pretty obviously that was a dumb outburst. <laughs> Next time somebody corrects your driving, just shut up and say thank you. Now, funny story. I was teaching a class. A gentleman raised his hand. This was just a few weeks ago. I did this story about yelling in the car. He raised his hand and he said, I have a very embarrassing story to tell. He said, two days ago, he said, my wife was always correcting my driving. But then he said, I would scream at my wife, quit doing that, quit doing that. I know how to drive. He said, two days ago, I was driving. He said, I'm embarrassed to say I ran a red light and plowed right into a car. The first thing he said I did is I looked at my wife and I said, why didn't you say anything? His wife goes, you're an idiot. <laughs> Now, I'm going to give you two examples of asking for input, a very negative and a very positive. First, the negative. Uh, there's a great book called The Checklist Manifesto, published by Dr. Atul Gawande at Harvard Medical School. A wonderful man, a great book, The Checklist Manifesto. Highly recommend it. He points out that if you go in for a surgery, and the nurse asks the doctor a series of very simple questions from a checklist. The odds on unneeded infection plummet, and the death rate because of unnecessary infection is cut by about two-thirds. The huge majority of hospitals around the world don't allow the nurse to ask the doctor the questions. Why? Ego. The surgeon's ego is too big. Now, Ben, you're, are you in the UK right now? I am in the United Kingdom right now, yes. A little good feedback for the UK. The NHS in the UK has finally stepped up to this last year, and they don't put up with us anymore. So God bless the NHS on this one. In the, in the, in the NHS, every surgery has to go through the checklist before they do the surgery, or they're out. They quit putting up with this nonsense. You're one of the few countries that had the guts to step up to this and deal with it effectively. So I've worked with the NHS before. They deserve some positive kudos for that. Now, that's the negative case study. The positive case study, every year I train the admirals in the United States Navy. I did that for nine years. They don't give me any money because their billing bureaucracy is an incredible pain in the butt. I don't want to fill out that many forms, so I do it for free. But they give me treats. Two years ago, my treat, day in a nuclear submarine. Me and eight other old men got to stand at the top of the submarine and go down under the waters for eight hours and pretend to torpedo things. We had a great time. Last year, my treat was even better. Where did I get to go? I went to a uh, danger zone. I don't know if anybody's seen the movie Top Gun. I got to fly 95 minutes on a U.S. Navy Top Gun fighter jet. Uh, six G's, G suit, flying upside down, doing tricks. Got to fly the plane myself, 10 minutes. And I'm very proud to say I did not throw up. Well, before we take off, I noticed this kid is asking my host, Admiral Marco Anini, a series of simple questions from a checklist. These weren't tricky questions. First question for the doctor is, did you wash your hands? First question for the fighter pilot is, how much fuel do you have? I said, sir, this is puzzling. The nurse, well, the doctor doesn't like the nurse asking the question because her ego's too big. I said, nobody's got a bigger ego than the U.S. Navy top gun fighter jet pilot who becomes an admiral. How come you don't care? The kid asks you the question. What's the difference? His answer was sad but true. He said, there's a huge difference. Operation crashes, you die plane crashes, I die. Put a gun to the doctor's head and said, this patient dies of an unneeded infection, I'm blowing your brains out. They'd ask the questions twice. Well, again, back to ego and pride. How important is it? But we often make it more important than health and safety and the people we love. Now then, the next thing is respond. 
Now, I don't know much about much, but I am a I am an expert on responding to 360 degree feedback. I'm a pioneer in this field. You know, for those of you listening to me, it's not always good to be called a pioneer. As Ben mentioned, I won the dreaded Lifetime Achievement Award from the Institute for Management Studies. What does that award mean? Well, he must be almost dead. Well, I don't know much about much, but I know a whole lot about how to respond to 360 degree feedback. This is what I teach every one of my coaching clients to do, positive, simple, focused, and fast. They all get feedback. And then I teach them to say, you know, thank you so much for participating in this coaching process. I got this 360-degree feedback. Thank you very much. Here's what I feel very positive about. And then they talk about all the positives. Then they don't say, but they say, and there's something I'd like to do better. And I try to keep this very simple and focused. For example, in the past, um, I've been stubborn and opinionated, not an open-minded listener. If I've done that to you or the people around you. I'm sorry. Please accept my apologies. There's no excuse. Then I teach my clients to just listen and think and ask for ideas for the future, not feedback about the past. So what they say is, I'm not going to ask you for more feedback about the past. I'm going to ask you for ideas for the future. If you had to have ideas for the future to help me be a positive, open-minded listener, what would they be? And this is feed forward. I teach them to sit there, listen, take notes, say thank you. Now, they never promise to do everything people say. Leadership's not a popularity contest. They say, you know, I can't promise to do everything you and everybody suggest, but I don't promise to listen to everybody and think of the ideas and do what I can. And I can't change the past. I, I can change the future. And I'm going to involve you and ask you to help me get better. Then the next step in the process is after responding is involve. And I have my clients involve everyone around them. And the keys to successful behavioral change are pretty simple. You need to set a clear goal. You need to write it down, publicly state the goal, and then get a support group to help you achieve your goal. If you do that, you're much more likely to achieve any positive change in behavior. The research on this is pretty compelling. Now, the next step is change. I had been in business 24 years before anybody asked me the great question. What was it? Does anybody ever really change? Well, I, I excuse me, I'd been in, in business 12 years before anybody asked me that question. Does anybody ever really change? I said I had 12 years experience. I have a PhD in organizational behavior, undergraduate degree in mathematics, and I don't know. I wasn't going to make up an answer. For 24 years, I've been coming up with the answer. Now I, I know who I know who changes, who doesn't change, why people change, why people don't change. Key to making change last is you have to follow up and stick with it. What's follow up sound like? And it's feed forward. About every two months, Mr. Coworker, two months ago, I said I want to be a positive and open-minded listener. Based on the last two months. Give me ideas for the next two months. It's been four months. Give me ideas. Six months, eight months, ten months. What happens if people do the follow-up in the feed-forward manner that I described? Well, I'm going to talk about this for changing behavior as well as changing perhaps perception. This is a study of 86,000 participants validated across industry and across culture. No country in the world this does not work. And, by the way, no industry in the world this does not work. So it works in every country, works in every industry. And again, if you want a copy of the article, if you don't already have it, send me an email or go to my website. Uh, leadership is a contact sport. Every leader in our research got multi-reader feedback. They were asked to discuss with a consultant, pick one to three things, and follow up, just like I described. And then we did a mini-survey a year later to measure, are they seen as becoming a more effective leader? What did we learn? When people said my coworker did no follow-up a year later, minus three less effective, zero didn't change, plus three more effective, five companies ask exactly the same question. Did this person become a more effective leader? Well, if you know about probability and statistics, this looks slightly better than a normal distribution curve. I've done something called a control group study. No training, no feedback, no nothing. The control group did this well. Statistically, these people might as well have been watching sitcoms as go to a training program or get feedback. Total waste of time. People said my coworker did a little follow-up, a little better. Some follow-up, a lot better. Frequent follow-up, much better. Consistent, periodic follow-up, massive improvement. They all went to the same program. It was taught by the same person in many cases, me. We got feedback on the same process at the same time. Well, you know what I learned from all this research? To quote my friend Alan Mulally, I tell my clients, if you get better, it doesn't have much to do with me. It's got everything to do with you. If you do this stuff, it works. Shockingly, it doesn't work if you don't do it. The first thing I teach all my new coaching clients is this. I say, I don't get paid if you don't get better. Better is not judged because of, of, by me or you. It's judged by everyone around you. Then I always say, 
I do not get paid because I am a great coach. I do get paid because you're a great client. Don't make this about me. If I'm the worst coach in the world and you get better, who cares? If I'm the best coach in the world and you don't get better, who cares? This is not a contest about me being a great coach. Let's focus on one thing, you achieving positive long-term change in behavior. And by the way, you pick the behavior and you pick the people. And if you're not the CEO, your CEO has to prove this whole thing. I don't tell you what's important, you tell me. And then my job is to help you get better at the most important stuff as judged by the most important people. Okay. One next question. Um, next question. Do people really change behavior or are they merely perceived as changing? And the answer is the opposite of what you might think. It's much easier to change behavior than changing perception. Changing perception is very, very hard. The best research principle in psychology is called cognitive dissonance theory. We all view people in a manner that's consistent with our previous stereotype. Now, if I have a stereotype of you that says you're a bad listener, I'm going to look for a bad listener in whatever you say and do until I find it. Let me give you a very simple behavioral example. Uh, let's imagine your problem is you make too many destructive comments. Now, I picked that because it seems so simple. You think, oh, it's easy to fix. Just quit doing it. I don't need to talk to people and follow up. Well, not so simple. Let's say you're my coworker. You have this issue with destructive comments and you decide to get better, but you don't talk to me and you do no follow-up. You go seven months and never make a destructive comment about anyone. Seven months later, you say, stupid SOBs and finance idiot bean counters. How do we get anything done in this company that's run by a bunch of idiotic accountants? I hear you. My reaction is, you have never changed. Situation B, you talk to me. You say, coworker Marshall, I want to be a great team player and not make destructive comments. Give me ideas for the future to help me. I give you ideas. I don't believe you're going to change, but I think, well, interesting you're doing this. Two months later, though, you come back and say, it's been two months. I said I want to be a great team player, not make destructive comments. Based on the last two months, give me ideas for the next two. Now I say, now I think about it and I say, you know, keep doing what you've been doing. You've been doing a great job. It's been four months. Great job. Six months. I say, you know, I didn't think you changed. It's been six months. You've done a fantastic job. Seven months later, stupid SOBs and finance idiot bean counters. Um, I say, you went seven months without doing that. You shouldn't have said that. The person says, you're right. I'm going to apologize to the team. Situation A, did behavior change? Yes. Did perception change? No. Situation B, did behavior change? Yes. Did perception change? Yes. In leadership, it doesn't matter what we say. It only matters what they hear. Okay, Ben, are you ready for another exercise with the listeners? I am indeed, Marshall. Shoot. Are we ready? I want everyone listening to me to look at your watches. Okay, look at your watch. Now, if you have a Roman numeral watch, look at your watch. If you have a Roman numeral watch, then what I want you to do is put – is Hide the face of your watch so you cannot see the face of your Roman numeral watch. Okay, hide it so you can't see it. Now I'm going to ask you two questions. Question number one, what does the 10 look like on your watch? Type in the uh, initial that represents the 10 or the initials that represent the 10 and send them to Ben. What does that Roman numeral 10 look like? And Ben, you tell me what you're getting. Um, I've got X, X, someone's on X, I. I'm going to say maybe 100 X's, one EX. All, almost all X's, right? Yes. All right. Now, all you same people, uh, don't look at your watch. What does the Roman numeral 4 look like? Please type that and send it in to Ben. 4. What does the 4 look like? And that's IV. Um, someone's done four I's. But pretty How much many good. IV's? I'm going to say probably about, about 100. What, per, what percent are IVs? Um, I'm going to say 95. 95% of you said that that Roman numeral was an IV. Now, I want you to look at your Roman numeral watch and look at the four. Answer this question. Is the four on your Roman numeral watch an IV? Send Ben a yes or no response. Is the four on your Roman numeral watch an IV? Look at it closely. That's we've got. I'm going to say eighty percent no. It almost all knows. 
Now, 95% of the people said the four was an IV, but it's not. It's four eyes. Learning point, we all see what we think is there. You could own that watch 30 years and most people will never see it. We all see what we think is there. Ben, did you know this yourself? Um, I guessed IV. <laughs> Everybody else does too. Well, we all see what we think is there. Now, the Roman god Jupiter symbol was an IV. They didn't have a J in the ancient Latin. J was an I, they didn't have a U. U was a V. IV was equivalent to JU, symbol of the god Jupiter, considered sacrilegious to put on a sundial. The Swiss copied the ancient sundials and made those watches and clocks. 98% of all watches and clocks that are Roman numerals have four eyes, and almost no one that owns it can see it. Why? We see what we think is there. We don't see what's there. Next, key learnings for leadership development. There's no reason that you can't do what I do. My coaching process is incredibly transferable. And by the way, you can do it. I don't care if you do it. If you do it and it helps anybody, send me an email. That's the price. I'll charge you one price for using my price. Send me a nice email. That makes me feel so good when people say, gee, I use your stuff and help people. Send me a nice email. That's, that's about it. And there's no reason you can't do what I do with pretty much the same success I have. You just need to follow the process. Now, let's review it again. First, when behavioral coaching doesn't work. One, it doesn't work with people who don't care. If they don't care, don't try to use this process. Two, it doesn't work with people who've been written off by the company. As an executive coach, I'm sure you've seen this. Some companies write people off and they don't have a chance, but they don't have the guts to fire them. So this fake developmental coaching process has nothing to do with development or coaching. It's just seek and destroy. This doesn't help people that lack business or technical knowledge. I get ridiculous requests for coaching. A pharmaceutical company calls me, Marshall, we want you to coach Dr. X. I said, what's his problem? He said, he's not updated on recent medical technology. I said, neither am I. Well, I can't make a bad doctor a good doctor, a bad scientist a good scientist. Very important. Behavioral coaching won't help people who are headed in the wrong direction or strategy. If somebody's going in the wrong direction, this stuff just helps them get there faster. Next, never coach ethics or integrity violations. Fire ethics or integrity violations. How many ethics violations does it take to ruin the reputation of the company? One, don't, co don't coach ethics problems. Fire ethics problems. And then next, sometimes it's just the wrong person in the wrong job at the wrong time. And it doesn't mean that the company's bad or the person's bad. It just means they need to be in another place. And that's okay. When will behavioral coaching work? If the issue is behavioral, the person's willing to try and they're given a fair chance. Now let's quickly review my coaching process, which is just going to build on everything I've discussed so far. First, involve the person in determining who are the key stakeholders. And if the person is not the boss, involve the person and their boss. I typically coach CEOs, but 30% of the people I coach are not CEOs, they're potential CEOs. If they're not the CEO, then I involve the CEO to determine who are their key stakeholders. Then I help the key stakeholders get involved in the process. I encourage the stakeholders when I interview them to let go of the past and be positive, supportive, and tell the truth. And, and, and make it two ways, not one way. So they say, you're trying to get better, let me get better too. Feed forward in both directions. That's what I encourage. Then I collect feedback. I ask very simple questions. If you'd like a, a sample of what some of the feedback reports would look like, send me an email. I'll send you a sample of a feedback report, what they look like. Uh, it's very straightforward stuff. I say, what's the person doing well? What do they need to do better? And, and if you were the person's mentor, coach, or advisor on any topic, large or small, what advice would you have? And I write a confidential report. You can't tell who said what the way the reports are written. Now, I do mine all by interviews. People say, do you use like survey tools and stuff? I don't. But again, they pay me a lot of money. And I'm dealing with very high-level people. There's nothing wrong with using survey tools or other techniques. It's just not what I do. So again, right now, I'm just pretty much describing what I do. Then have the person respond to key stakeholders, just like we described. They come back and they talk to everybody one-on-one. -on -one. They say, thank you for participating. Here's what I learned. Here's what I feel good about. Give me ideas. We practice feed forward. Then they do ongoing follow-up with their stakeholders, and I do ongoing follow-up with them. Now, my coaching process is hyper-efficient. Why? The key, cost of, the key cost of my clients hiring me is one thing, their time. Let's say I'm coaching Ian Reid, the CEO of Pfizer. What's his time worth? His time's worth more than my time. He's not paying me to waste his time. I'm there to get results 
the best way I can and the most efficient way I can. Not to waste his time. I don't get paid for spending time. I get paid for getting results. Well, this is very efficient because everything I do is either required or optional. The required, there's no arguing. Either do it or I refuse to coach. You have to get confidential feedback. You have to talk to people. You have to be willing to apologize for your sins, follow up, practice feed forward on a regular basis, and get measured. If they don't want to do that, it's fine. I'm not here to judge anyone. I just say, don't, don't work with me. After that, it's all feed forward for me. I tell my clients, I'm going to give you my ideas. Hey, if it makes sense for you, do it. doesn't make sense for you, it's okay. You don't have to. Don't do it. It's got to come from your heart anyway, not mine. So this saves so much time in judging and arguing. Now, how can you use this with a team? Very simply, you say one to ten scale. You get the team together. Say there's eight people in the team. You say, everybody gets two little pieces of paper. On one page, say, right, one to ten scale, how well are we doing in terms of working together as a team? And the second, how well do we need to be doing? The average team in the world, they think they're 5.8. They want to be an 8.7. Then you focus on helping them pick one behavior to improve for the team. For example, we'll all get better if we listen. And then each person practices feed forward, where they get in the habit of asking each other team member, okay, I'm going to do a great job of helping the team. Give me one or two ideas for the future, no feedback about the past, and they say thank you. They all practice feed forward. Then each person picks one behavior to improve, and we have a very simple three-question follow-up process. By the way, this is all published, team building without time wasting. You can either send me an email or go to my website. It's on the website. And this three-question follow-up process is, I say, three questions about once a month. One, everybody's trying to be a better listener. Give me one or two ideas. Tell me to be a great listener. Two, my own personal area for improvement is recognition. Give me one or two ideas. And then three, I want to be a great team player. Just tell me to be a great team player. Very simple process. Follow-up, follow-up, follow-up measurement, follow-up, follow-up, follow-up measurement. Amazing how well this works. Now, finally, final topic I'm very excited about, and you're going to have an opportunity to participate if you wish. Employee engagement. I go to this presentation. I'm a fellow of the National Academy of Human Resources. I go to this presentation on employee engagement, and I listen to these people make a presentation, and it's about everything companies are doing on employee engagement, and it's all good. It involves things like, oh, um, empowerment and good training and fair pay and recognition. All, these are smart people. It's all good stuff. 100% of what was discussed was what the company can do to engage you. 0% is what can you do to engage yourself. Well, I go over this with my daughter, Kelly. If you're from the States, you may have seen my daughter. My daughter, Kelly, is a graduate of Duke University, was on the TV show Survivor Africa, after being on Survivor, she worked with Mark Burnett, the famous reality TV producer, two years. She did casting for Survivor, The Amazing Race. She then got a PhD at Yale University, and now she's a behavioral marketing professor at the Kellogg School of Management at Northwestern. So, and she was nominated as one of the five professors of the year this year, so Daddy's just a little bit proud. So working with my daughter Kelly, she reviews all this stuff and says, you know, Daddy, Everything done in this area of employee engagement involves passive questions. Do you have meaningful work? Do you have a friend at work? Do you have clear goals? And she said, when you ask people a passive question and they have a negative response, it'll almost always be environmental. Oh, I don't have clear goals because my boss is confusing or the company is strange. Kelly taught me about active questions. Now, here is your assignment. Should you wish to participate, send me an email and say, I would like to participate in this study. Ten days. Every day, six active questions. The questions start with, did I do my best to? Every day, you test yourself on, on these six questions. Did I do my best to be happy? Number one. Not, did the company make me happy? Did I do my best to be happy myself? Number two, did I do my best to find meaning? Not, did other people create meaning for me? Did I create meaning for myself? Did I do my best to be fully engaged? Did I do my best to build positive relationships? Did I do my best to set clear goals and make progress toward achieving my goals? Well, our research on this is pretty amazing. The first 1,433 participants in 19 different studies, 30% said I got better at everything. 60% said I got better on at least four of the six. 86% said I got better on at least one item. 
and 0% said they got worse. Now I say zero, something like 0.2%, but rounded off, it's 0% got worse. So it is amazing how well this worked. So if you'd like to participate, all you do is send me an email. Say, I'd like to participate in the study. You'll get an email every day for two weeks, and then you get before and asked for questions, and then it takes about two minutes a day to do this. And finally, let me wrap up. Well, before I wrap up, Ben, I've got about another eight minutes left. Uh, any questions for me that anybody would have for our last eight minutes? So I have a couple of time for a few questions. Ben, good questions for me. What might they be? Um, okay. So um, do you have the meeting together? When you're having the meeting, do you have it together with your client and the stakeholders? Sometimes do, sometimes don't. If I practice the team building without time wasting, I do. On the other hand, that's not a requirement. I often work with the client one-on-one -on -one and then the stakeholders one-on-one. -on -one. I like to work with them all together if I can, though. I'd, I'd put that desirable but not required. Excellent question. Next question. Have you always used the pay for results model? If not, what caused you to switch? Uh, you know, I, I got into that purely by accident. I've always done it. One of the people I started working with years ago, and I was much younger than it was 30 years ago probably, is a CEO. He said, I got this kid working for us, young, smart, dedicated, hardworking, driven to achieve, creative, entrepreneurial jerk. It would be worth a fortune to me if I could change a guy's behavior. So I hear the word fortune. I said, I like fortunes. Maybe I could help him. He said, I doubt it. I don't know why. That's when I came up with my idea. I said, I'll work with a guy for a year. If he gets better, pay me. If you don't get better, free. You know what he said? Sold. Since then, all of my work has been done that way. Very cool. Very cool indeed. Um, do active questions essentially prompt awareness and drive behavior? Yeah, active questions do two things. One, they prompt awareness. And two, they get us focused on what we can change and, and remove that victimhood of focusing on what I can't change anyway. So we quit focusing on what the world is giving me and we start focusing on what can I give the world. Okay, thank you for that. How do you negotiate between Next. sorry, how do you negotiate between the client and the stakeholder if their goals or views are different? You know, I've really never had a problem with that. I, I think it's theoretically an interesting question. Practically, the stakeholders give the feedback. The client picks things to improve based on stakeholder feedback anyway. So they're sharing with the stakeholders what the stakeholders basically have told them in the first place. And it's all good stuff. I mean, they're all trying to listen better or give better recognition or be more inclusive or something. So that's a theoretically interesting question. Practically, in my 30 years, I've never had to be a problem. Thank you, Marshall. Next. <sighs> I, I'm working with a coachee who doesn't rate themselves as important and is struggling to take protected time to focus on development actions. How can I motivate them to do so? You know, I, I like the idea of providing structure. So you actually start measuring how many hours, minutes, whatever, do they spend on developmental activities because if you don't, they'll just put it off and never do it. Even though they may understand that it's important, they won't, get, quote, get around to it because they'll always be too busy. I'm a great believer in measurement. If you don't measure things, number one, how do you know they happen? And then number two, they're less likely to happen. So I would try to put together some kind of measurement system and get them to sign off on it. Good question. Next. Does feed forward on a large scale impact the collective capacity to act? Yes, I think it does. And if you look at our study, Leadership as a Contact Sport, obviously that wasn't two or three people. That was thousands of people from around the world. So what it does, it creates a much more positive environment toward action as opposed to, again, an environment of victimization and focusing on what we can't do. You focus on what you can do. Next. Okay, quite, quite a few questions around this. Um, as you said, the approach works when there is a right culture for change. Um, how do you measure this? Well, it's not what people say, it's what they do. In my coaching clients, they have to do the work. If they don't do the work, I don't work with them. 
and it really doesn't matter what they say to me because I don't get paid because I like them or they, I think they're great. I get paid because they do the work. If they do the work, they get better. Now, Ben, let me finish with my favorite coaching exercise. Are you ready? I'm ready. I try to teach all my clients to do this. Take a deep breath. Imagine you're 95 years old and you're just getting ready to die. But right before you take that breath, you're given a great gift. The ability to go back in time and talk to the person that's listening to me right now. The ability to help that person be a better coach, have a better life. What advice would the 95-year-old you who knows what mattered and what didn't and what was important and what wasn't have for the you that's listening to me right now? Well, whatever you're thinking now, do that. Some friends of mine interviewed old folks who were dying. They got to ask this question, what advice would you have? Three themes came up in the answer from old people facing death. Theme number one, be happy now. Not like next week, next month, next year. Be happy now. Great Western disease, I'll be happy when. When I get the money, status, BMW, condominium. Learning point from old people. Don't get so wrapped up looking at what you don't have. You can't see what you do have. Learning point number two, friends and family. When you look around your deathbed, none of your coworkers are waving goodbye. You realize your friends and family are important. And number three, if you have a dream, go for it. Because if you don't when you're 35, you might not when you're 85. Business advice isn't different. Number one, have fun. By the way, if you can't have fun in the executive coaching business, you can't have fun doing anything. You're not going to have fun being an accountant. Number two is people. And a real blessing in this job is we all get to help people. Do whatever you can to help people. Not just for money. I do a lot of volunteer work. Do as many good deeds as you can. What the heck. And if you can help others get better. By the way, if any of my stuff helps you, the only cost is you help somebody else and we'll call it even. Try to help as many people as you can. And the final thing is also the same. Go for it. Old people almost never regret the risk they took and failed. We always regret the risk we did not take. And the final thing I would like to say, Ben, is I had a wonderful time working with everybody. I hope that some of your listeners found this stuff to be practical, useful, have a little bit better life, hopefully can use some of this in their own coaching. And if I can help your listeners help others, then we've all made the world just a little bit better place. Thank you so much, Marshall. An absolutely fantastic session once again. Um, ladies and gentlemen, just before you leave, um, can you please um, jump onto Facebook if you're on Facebook, facebook.com forward slash WBECS and post your feedback. We love it. It's good for other people because when you post it on there, other people see it and they learn about Marshall's work and then um, you create this kind of viral effect of awesomeness. And um, as you know, you know, Marshall's teaching is pretty rock and roll. And so the more people that can learn about it, um, the more that we can develop our industry and the, the practices and thought leadership out there. So um, we have another session in 30 minutes time. We have Catherine Tolper, who is the CEO of the Association for Coaching. Uh, I believe she's going to be talking about uh, coaching global leaders and their teams. Um, I will look forward to you joining us for that. Um, but oh, wait, I got a question. My yes. email address, marshall at marshallgoldsmith.com. Yes. I've, I've posted it for everyone already, Marshall. I put it in the okay. in the in the right hand side. So thank you. Okay, so, good. So yes, and Marshall does actually get back to everyone. He's not actually got to an, an assistance out there tapping away at everything. So do do take advantage of access to the world's number one leadership thinker. It's pretty cool. Um, now thank you so much, Marshall. Once again, um, absolutely brilliant. Marshall's one of I think one people in fact, well maybe one other that we've had speak every year. Um, so far and hopefully you'll come and join us again next year Marshall um, thank you it would be an absolute honor once again and uh, and as I said everybody keep an eye out for um, a little project that me and Marshall are going to be working on something very exciting um, and I will tell you more about that in the near future so okay guys take care I've got to prepare for the next session thank you once again Marshall for a rock and roll session and everybody have a brilliant day and I will see you in 30 minutes take care everyone thank you bye-bye